So hello from OER 17 to the future. We have three talks scheduled now, and the first one will be by Timothy Reed. He's from UNET Spain, and he will talk about Moonlight, a MOOC on inclusion. But I won't give this talk. He will. So please give a warm welcome to Timothy Reed. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for resisting the coffee break to be here for the, the start. OK. So as the title says, I'm going to talk about the uh, Moonlight Project, which is a, an Erasmus Plus project we started at the end of uh, last year, particularly focusing on the uh, social inclusion and employability of uh, refugees. You've got the acronym there and the, the project to reference. And taking part in this project, we've got uh, partners from um, seven universities, six European universities, and a, and a UK one as well. And um, really, uh, United, for those of you who don't know the university, we've been around for almost 50 years now. We've got a long history of working with uh, people with disabilities and, and, uh, and prisoners, so it seems like a natural extension to move into this area. And uh, really, the, the data about the refugee situation, at least the last information I have from 2015, made it seem like a particular area that was worthy of our, of our attention. And I think of some of the data I could present you, the idea that uh, there's 24 people a minute who are being forced to move away from their home for reasons of um, natural disasters or war made it uh, something that was uh, really needed, a problem that needed to be solved, or should we say a, a process that needed to be attended to, if we don't want to use the word um, problem. And I think if we pay a particular attention to the aspect of education, then this uh, information is even more poignant. For example, that uh, refugee children, refugee children are five times more likely to be out of um, formal schooling than their, uh, their standard count counterparts. 91% of children are in primary education in comparison to only 50% of refugees. That's 84% of adolescents in secondary education in comparison to 22% of uh, refugees. 34% of youth in universities and only 1% of, um, of refugees. So in total we're talking somewhere in the region of about 300 million youth not in any form of education, which really seems to be a, a great waste of a very c productive part of their, of their lives. And um, there was a very poignant article published in The Guardian some time ago, which I think says this really uh, um, quite well. And it's not just a question that uh, refugees being made victims because they're forced to move away from their home. It's a question of uh, impotence in a way, that they're not allowed to take part in any autonomous and uh, proactive way in, their, uh, in taking charge of, uh, of their life, which in a way can, I think it would happen to any of us if all of a sudden we were made to move away from this room and be forced to uh, uh, take part in a process which we weren't actually, wasn't actually under our control. We start to feel alienated from that. And uh, one of the natural conclusions of that could, in fact, be radicalization. So it's something that we really need to, to take seriously. If I give you a practical example, in the, uh, the Dada refugee camp in Kenya, there's somewhere in the region of 350,000 Somali refugees there. Now, there's a, probably a reasonable representation, a cross-section of their society in that particular camp. But the sad irony there is that none of them are actually allowed to work or take part in any constructive way of, of giving back to the surrounding area, which is really... Um, a bit of a shame, really. It's not enabling them to become self-sufficient or, or look after themselves. And I don't think we have to go that far. I don't want to give any uh, name any countries, but in the European uh, social context, for example, even the countries that are receiving refugees aren't necessarily allowing them to uh, become proactive in looking at, after their own futures. One thing's the data. The other thing is what the actual people themselves say. And the interesting thing, I was talking to some refugees in the uh, Mobile Learning Week uh, conference in Paris a couple of weeks ago, is that they're fully aware that they need to get the education, but it's terribly difficult for them to be able to do this. I mean, there's quite some harrowing stories of younger people who've moved away from their families. They've traveled several uh, thousand uh, kilometers to get to a, a new country just to be able to have access to basic education, something which we almost take for granted here. So. Um, what can, we, what can we try and do to help this situation? And um, I think it's something interesting was said by Ralph Gruner, the UNHCR representative for France in this, uh, in this conference. And that is that the, the majority, more than 90% of refugees that are in cities or close to cities have access to or covered by 2G or 3G networks. So if we could somehow combine this with mobile technology and open educational resources, then maybe, just maybe, we might be able to uh, find some way of helping them to uh, to take an active control of their own learning um, process. And 
I think uh, we've seen these sorts of uh, pictures on the, in the media and on the, on the newspapers that the mobile devices are really quite an important um, resource for, our, for refugees and also uh, a tool they can use in many different aspects of their, um, of their life and, and education and therefore can become part of this, of this uh, solution. But unfortunately the situations are very difficult. If it were just so easy as putting some open educational resources which could be de deployed in a flexible way on mobile devices, then this has already been done to some extent. Why don't we have this solution already um, available? And the answer to that question, although it's partially open and I'll leave it for you to, to think about, is that there are problems at all different kinds of levels. I mean, political problems, for example. This is what I was mentioning before, that a lot of um, refugees aren't able to uh, access the resources they require. In fact, in one particular country that I, I don't want to um, name, that even if the refugees manage to um, travel the large distances and get there, they're not allowed to have access to the educational resources, even if they're open, until they have permission to live there. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, it's catch-22. You, you need to have the basic language skills to be able to live and work. You can't live and work until you've got permission to live there. You go around in a circle and go nowhere. And um, I think this uh, fits in quite nicely to some of the other things that we've heard um, in the, the conference yesterday, the idea that uh, the way a lot of the, the mobile open social learning is actually set up is, is typically done for, for Western Europeans, and it doesn't take into account the way that people from a more Middle Eastern men of uh, perspective and background would actually want to work with these resources, and that's actually something that I think we need to, to take into account, especially when we're trying to work on mobile pedagogy to include these social and cultural um, aspects. Okay, now, as I said before, a lot of projects have actually been undertaken. The results are quite, are quite promising. Not just for the fortunate few refugees that are living in city areas. I've seen examples of, of uh, mobile network kits, which are small boxes which can run off a car battery and extend a Wi-Fi over a refugee camp. Some stuff's been doing on that. But what we're really trying to do in this project is to build upon the, uh, these sorts of projects and attack the, um, the questions in a, in a different and more top-down and bottom-up way. So if I can now just basically talk about what we're trying to do in the, in, the, in the project. The first thing is that there are lots of opportunities. There's lots of good work being done with um, the massive open online courses. Um, there's the um, Kirin University, for example, in Germany, which I think is a really good example. Um, companies like um, Coursera have um, announced a little while ago that they're starting new initiatives specifically targeting the refugees. But the difficulty is, in the first place, getting the information to the refugees. I mean, this is analogous to the situation that um, some years ago when I used to research into mobile language learning or online language learning, if you go into Google, for example, and you search for second language resources, there's millions of them on there, all sorts of different texts, recordings, videos, interactive activities. So the question if, is, if all this content and activity is there, why don't people speak the language any better? And the problem is that it really does need to be structured. You need to have a top-down pedagogic model, and the people need to know how to engage in an active way with these resources. That's one of the questions. That's something else we want to uh, look into. And the other thing, as I said before, is the political problems. There are political problems. I mean, we're trying to attack these from a bottom-up perspective in the sense of, going to the universities and talking to them, because a lot of European universities do offer certification for their MOOCs. But the problem is with this certification is that you have to pay for it. So you can negotiate. You can go along and say, look, we've got this problem here. The refugees need our help. Will you offer this sort of certification for free? And in a lot of cases, you can do that. But in the best case scenario, you can get a particular university to certify its own MOOC content to enable refugee students to do their own studies. That's just not enough. We need cross-institution, cross-country scenarios. And that's a lot harder. And you can say, OK, we'll do it from a top-down perspective. We we'll go and talk to politicians and try and negotiate it that way. Well, I've done that as well, and that's not necessarily successful. Back in 2012, when we were getting the MOOC initiatives running in Spain, I went to try to speak to the Minister of Education to, to apply this as a general way of um, providing professional training for people. And obviously, one doesn't get to speak to the minister. You sort of speak to a, a sub-secretary of state. But anyway, it's someone in the, the political hierarchy. And you have this conversation. And they say, oh, this seems like a, quite a good idea. We've got a high percentage of unemployed people. We've got the technology. We've got the MOOCs. Why don't we give them basic skill training, which will make them more employable? And then when we come out of the crisis, they'll be better ready to actually take the jobs. Unfortunately, nothing came out of it. It's very, very difficult. It's like moving really large stones when you're trying to push them along a beach, for example. So the approach we're trying in this project, which is different, is trying to make use of the fact that, in a way, uh, politics is a bit like uh, nuclear physics. What you really need to get is critical mass. If you haven't got critical mass, 
you don't get the chain reaction. And that's what we're trying to do now. We're trying to contact with lots of networks, with lots of groups, get them all moving in the same direction. And then we've got sufficient voices to make the complaints heard. It's the time to then try and produce political change, which is, in a way is why I'm here to talk to you about this, um, this project today. At the same time, we're trying to scaffold the learning and the MOOCs to make them deploy better on mobile devices, specifically for audiences who are not um, Western Europeans and um, also try and do some cost-benefit analysis to um, make the, the whole issue of, of interest to uh, the different uh, institutions and players in this, uh, in this question. We're specifically focusing on language learning and business skills. I think, uh, obviously, if you don't dominate a language, at least maybe a high B1, B2, possibly more in a country, you've really got very little chance of proper social integration. I mean, you probably know more about this than I do. So I think that's, some, some, that's a particular goal. And why are we focusing on business as opposed to science or other kinds of skills? Well, one of the problems I've mentioned before is that if people are not being taken seriously by they, uh, and being offered a job, if you've got business acumen, you can start your own spin-off. You can start your own small businesses with crowdfunding, and that way offer a solution to your own uh, people. And that's... Uh, the sorts of things we're trying to work. We've been working in language MOOCs for some considerable time, so it seems like a natural extension in this particular area. And also making use of, um, of CLIL. There's a lot of CLIL. It's quite a popular way of, um, of teaching in languages. So what we're thinking about this is, is it possible to actually scaffold CLIL for um, refugees in, uh, in a MOOC context and, uh, and make it a particularly effective uh, means or vehicle for them to, to learn? Where are we at the moment? We're, we, before we start talking and we start preaching, we want to listen, we want to understand. And there's an incredibly large number of res, uh, refugee support groups and networks, people who've been working for, for decades or more with these uh, refugees, and um, really think that we need to um, talk to these people. So we're getting our, in this particular month in the, the timing of the project, we're talking to them, we're having interviews, and we want to listen to them to find out what they think about it. Uh, is the correct way to put all these pieces together in the most effective way. And we're hoping to actually channel our initiative via these groups to give them the power, if you like, and not try and work directly with the, the refugees because then we just become another um, cog in the, in the wheel. So that's basically what I wanted to, to say about the project. It's more of a show and tell than come along with results, results because we, we started just a, a little time ago. If there's anyone who's interested in taking part in the project and who would like to just kept, be kept informed then please ask now or afterwards. Thank you very much. I come to you with the microphone because we have a live stream and a recording, so your question will be only understandable if you put it into the microphone. Um, thank you very much. I, I was looking forward to this talk since I saw the program. Uh, I'm doing my PhD at the moment and I'm, I'm looking at personal learning environments and how, in a way, and I do think it is a solution for refugee education, mm. although I think that the scaffolding is key. They, and there is another thing. Um, I can't say, I'm a, it, it would be too much to say I am a refugee because I left my country because of very bad conditions and very terrible situation. And there is a whole emotional aspect that really comes into the learning. And I think it's quite difficult for them who has, they have really a very terrible situation. So I think I would love to take part in the project. Um, I am a math teacher and I also think that that's another skill that would be very, just in a very low level, but it would be, so just to say my admiration for the project and I would love to, in a way, do what I ever can. Either it is through my PhD and maybe addressing things that I, maybe don't know now and I could address that and then offering my 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 you know my time the little I have but I just think it's marvelous really very 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 beautiful project Thank you very much and we're more than happy to uh, to include you in the uh, in the collaboration and in the in the in the project I mean it's a very frustrating uh, situation and, w and one thing is to be bombarded with all the the news from the 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 television and the, and the social media where well, that happens so often you get to a certain position where you're desensitized in a way. But it's when you're actually in the, in the conferences and the workshops and you're the refugee support group and you actually talk to the people and you have faces and names and, and, and stories and it becomes, uh, it puts the hairs on your arms and makes them stand up in a way. So thank you very much. We'll definitely sit up. Thank you. Hi there. I, I agree that was really interesting and a brilliant project you're doing. 
can you just clarify again? You told us the aims, but what exactly is the project doing? Are you working with MOOC providers to get them to make their MOOCs more accessible and more um, sort of targeted towards that audience, or are you working with universities that might later recognize credits obtained from the MOOCs, or what's your actual focus of, of activity? It has more than one particular objective. I mean, it would make sense for us to start to prepare MOOCs for refugees because there really is quite a, a, a wonderful offer. I think what we're really focusing on is trying to join the dots, if you, will, if you like, because on the one hand, we need to talk to the universities to persuade them that um, this is a, a group of people who should have a you know, special attention so that if they come along, I mean, for example, there are not every and we're assuming that they don't some of them don't have basic education and that, that's also the also the case but some people are, are do already have degrees they all have to have qualifications and they're they're professionals but they've been displaced the second you use your social context your qualifications are no longer no longer recognized and you talk to people and if they're really lucky they're working in the service industry and they might be chartered engineers or economists and it's so frustrating to them they're terribly grateful because they've got nothing better so it's it's trying to to address all the particular questions and um as I said before, the experience we've had from trying to do this just with MOOCs back in 2012 when it was getting off the ground is that you can't just uh, try and get, change the particular level. If you just got from a bottom-up level, for example, you only address the teachers, for example. Then the teachers might be on board, but their institutions might not be on board. And even if they are, the local government won't be. And you've got the national governments and the European uh, government. And um, I think it is the case in, um, in some of the, you know, the CNHCR, for example, they make a lot, a lot of recommendations, and sometimes it's... You know, speaking to, to deaf people, the message doesn't really get through. So I think you need to find the appropriate approach for the different levels. And I think that's what we're trying to do. I think it's why, why we got the funding. I think if we put forward a, pro, uh, a project at the end of 2016, just saying, oh, no, we're going to do MOOCs for refugees, we have never got the, the funding in a million years. Tina Papathoma from uh, the Open University. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I just wanted to say that um, if I can help with, in, with your next step uh, uh, with the interviews, I come from Greece originally and I will be uh, there in the summer. Uh, so, and I have some connections with uh, uh, some youth camps and I know people who work there. Uh, so if I could help with this and interview some people, because I'm doing qualitative research as well in MOOCs, uh, but uh, I have interviewed uh, educators, really. Uh, I would be happy to help. We will find the way with the language and all that. I can contact you later. Thank you very much. Um, I know that some very, they're doing some very interesting things in, in Greece and, and giving some wonderful support. In fact, I've got a, a friend who's a, a psychologist and a, as, a, as voluntary work, she's working in the, in the camps there trying to cancel the people. But it's... Um, it's really hard because, of course, when you're, when you're talking one-on-one, -on -one, you're saying, but isn't this really difficult, really tough trying to counsel people because how can you really make them feel better about the circumstances when the circumstances really are very, very difficult? It's like saying, you know, when you're in a, in a, a, a lake up to your neck with water full of, of crocodiles, it's hard to admire the view. I mean, the, the whole social context in which they're in is really, really difficult. Even something as basic as the camps. I mean, I've seen, for example, I've been inside of one of these refugee tents, and you look at it and you think, oh, that's not quite so bad. And, but you kind of, you're role-playing being there maybe a week or two weeks. But some people are in these tents for 20 years. I mean, some children born, live, and die their entire lives there. So, I mean, it's really, it's really difficult. So thank you very much. We'll that on that. <laughs>